Hello, my name is Andrew Morris and I'm Head of Pharmacy at Swansea University. This is the second in a series of tutorials looking at reaction kinetics. If you've not already listened to tutorial one, when medicines go bad, I suggest you go back and listen to that first. In this tutorial, we will examine how we can monitor and quantify the breakdown of a drug within a medicine. So let's start off by thinking about how we might quantify the drug content of a, of a tablet. So one of the first things we need to think about is that most methods of quantification actually require a drug to be in solution. Yet here we are with a tablet, which is a solid dosage form. So if investigating a tablet formulation, then the first thing you'd probably need to do is crush up the tablet and then extract the drug with some type of solvent. That, that might be an organic solvent such as ethanol or it could just be water. Essentially we're selecting a solvent in which the drug in the tablet is going to uh, dissolve. And then once we have the drug in solution, and of course there might be other things in that tablet as well, we need to think about that we we need to quantify that drug somehow or one of the, the breakdown products of that drug. So if you're looking at quantifying the drug, then you'll be expecting the amount present or the concentration present to be declining. If you're looking at one of the breakdown products of a drug, then you would expect the concentration of that to be rising. Of course, what we need to also consider is there might be things present in that tablet which could interfere with our method of analysis. Those uh, interfering substances could just be other excipients, so non-active ingredients in the tablet, or they could actually be um, products of the, the, the breakdown which interfere with the, the drug itself. So let's go back to the drug we were looking at in tutorial one. So remember that was the ester drug, aspirin. And we talked about how when water is added to aspirin, you get hydrolysis and the aspirin breaks down to two products, salicylic acid and ethanoic acid or acetic acid as it's also known. So if you want to quantify the amount of aspirin um, present, you can essentially either develop a method of analysis which will directly quantify the aspirin present, or alternatively you can look at a method which quantifies either the formation of salicylic acid or the formation of ethanoic acid. And then by deduction you would be able to work out the concentration of aspirin which is present. So there are lots of possible different methods of uh, quantifying a drug in solution and you'll learn about many of these in your A-level chemistry curriculum. What we're going to look at here is uh, something called UV visible spectrometry or otherwise known as UV vis spectrometry and the the setup that we've got at the top of the slide is a schematic representation of what's going on inside a UV vis spectrophotometer. So on the, the right hand side you would have a, a, a light source. Um, now in reality there's probably uh, two different light sources, two different bulbs within the, uh, the UV spectrophotometer. But let's just consider for the simplicity that there's only one. So coming from that light source that would then pass through something called a cuvette. So a, a cuvette is essentially just a, um, a, sort of a rectangular uh, holder of the solution. Think of it as being a bit like a rectangular uh, test tube if you like. And you can see in the example here we've got the drug um, in solution has been added to that. Um, UV cuvettes are normally made of a particular types of uh, glass or plastic which allow a light of a certain wavelength to, to pass through without hindering it. Uh, then you would also have 
a detector which is then basically detecting the, um, the light which has passed through the cuvette and that detector will then be uh, attached in via some, some complex electronic trickery to give you an absorbance reading um, itself. Um, so I should I actually say as well the light source contains um, or, or has something called a monochromator that the light will pass through um, and that enables you to fix the, the wavelength of light which then passes through the drug in solution. So you can be very specific so that the, the light which passes through is, is only of a certain wavelength. So what you'll see so it's something like this the, uh, the, the light beam from the light source passing through the drug in solution which is held in the, in the UV cuvette and the, the light which is able to um, permeate through the drug in solution reaches the detector and you would get an absorbance reading. Um, the absorbance reading itself is in what we refer to as arbitrary units. So in terms of the concentration um, it doesn't tell you that much and we'll look at how we can convert these absorbance arbitrary units into a real concentration a little bit later on. So that's just a sort of a schematic representation. The actual uh, piece of kit itself, so here we've got a UV vis spectrometer. So this is just a sort of a simple uh, bench top uh, lab UV vis spec that we've got here. They come in all sorts of different sizes and shapes. So this one itself you can see just about, if I circle it uh, there, you can see we're looking down on the top of the UV cuvette and the drug solution would be inside of that. Um, so if we sort of zoom in this is what we'd essentially see. So from this angle you can sort of see it is a, a rectangular a cuvette with the liquid inside and on this particular piece of equipment the the light beam is passing from the right through to the to the left itself and um, there are as I say various different types of UV vis spectrometers um, some of them will hold just one cuvette as is the case here so with this type of UV spec what you would need to do is firstly um, calibrate or zero the UV spec before you use it. So in order to do that you would just add whatever uh, solvent you've got your drug dissolved in. So let's assume you've got your drug dissolved in water. So you would just add water to the UV cuvette. You would do a reading and then you would zero the machine. Then you take out the cuvette, tip the water away, and then you would add the drug solution to that, and then you would see what the absorbance is. So by doing that, you know that the light which is absorbed is only being absorbed by the drug which is in solution, and it's not being absorbed by the solvent itself. Other sort of larger, more expensive, slightly more complex uh, UV vis spectrometers they might actually have two or holders for two different UV cuvettes and in one of them you would have the uh, sort of a, a reference in which you would just have the, the solvent and no drug and in the other one you would have a sort of a test cuvette, you'd have your drug in solution in that and the spectrophotometer would s sort of essentially shine two beams through the, the two cuvettes at the same time and subtract the one reading from the other. Um, but in effect you end up with the same result, um, whichever one of these different pieces of kit you're using, and you end up with a reading which is telling you how much light the drug is, um, is absorbing. So with UV vis spectrometry, the amount of light that the drug in solution actually absorbs is dependent on a number of different factors. Firstly, it's dependent on the drug itself and the presence of what's called a chromophore within that uh, drug or compound. So a chromophore is the part of a molecule uh, which potentially absorbs light. Um, it's, the amount absorbed is also dependent upon the wavelength of the light. 
So for example, a drug may absorb light at one wavelength, but not at another. Um, and it's also dependent upon the concentration of the drug in solution. So the greater that concentration, then the, uh, the greater the amount or proportion of light which gets um, absorbed. So thinking about our breakdown reaction of aspirin that you can see here. So we've got aspirin on the, uh, on the left reacting with water to salicylic acid and ethanoic acid. So in terms of deciding whether we can use UV visible spectrometry to quantify aspirin here, what we first need to think about is um, the wavelength that we will choose to actually uh, select to do our measurements at. So in order to do that, what we would do is actually a scan of the drug in solution at a variety of different wavelengths. So you could you know, dissolve your um, aspirin, for example, in solution, and then you would run the scan starting at a lower wavelength and then going to a higher wavelength. So the line you've just seen appear on this graph is the absorbance of the light by the aspirin in solution at different wavelengths. So what you can see is that the, the lower wavelength, so certainly sort of 280, 260 uh, nanometers and below, the absorbance is high. But as you approach 300 nanometers and then go higher, the, uh, the, the light is not being absorbed at all by the aspirin in solution. Now, let's look at what that scan would look like if instead of having aspirin in solution, we used salicylic acid. So with salicylic acid, you can sort of see you get a, a very different pattern here with the, the blue line, which has appeared. So you can see you get sort of a little maximum uh, just sort of below 260 nanometers. Then the absorbance falls a bit like it did for aspirin. But then it starts to rise again as you approach 300 nanometers. And then ultimately it falls off uh, much later. So what you might realize now is looking at these two scans of firstly aspirin and then salicylic acid, one of the, uh, the breakdown products, is that there is a region on this particular graph. Let me show you that region in blue where aspirin is hardly absorbing any UV light at all, whereas salicylic acid, one of the products, is absorbing lots of UV light. So if you were to select a wavelength, say around 300 nanometers, in order to do all of your analysis, although your aspirin is going to be mixed up with the salicylic acid and the ethanoic acid, by selecting the wavelengths of 300 nanometers, you can sort of be very specific that any absorbance you know is only coming from the salicylic acid and not from the aspirin. So that basically allows you to monitor the breakdown of aspirin to salicylic acid, um, even though they're all mixed up in the same solution. And what you would expect to see as this reaction progresses, so as the salicylic acid is formed from the aspirin, then the absorbance of UV light at around about 300 nanometers is going to start to increase. Uh, ethanoic acid doesn't absorb any UV light at all at that wavelength, so you know that all of the absorbance is coming from the salicylic acid. So you have a, a, an accurate way of monitoring and ultimately quantifying the concentration of salicylic acid being formed. Now remember I said earlier the absorbance units we're looking at, they're just arbitrary units. So when we look at reaction kinetics, we always want to know about molar concentrations. So what we'll think about on the next slide is how we can potentially convert those arbitrary units of absorbance into actually molar concentrations, which we can then use in some of our reaction kinetics calculations.
So just to recap, so rather than monitoring the, the actual breakdown of aspirin, we're going to be looking at monitoring and quantifying the formation of salicylic acid from aspirin. And then by deduction, we can work out how much the concentration of aspirin is falling. So we saw how the UV spectrophotometer can uh, give us the absorbance that the salicylic acid solution is, uh, is, is absorbing in an arbitrary unit. But we want to convert that to a molar concentration. Because when we look at our breakdown um, of aspirin uh, equation, so you've basically got one mole of aspirin reacting with one mole of water to give one mole of salicylic acid and one mole of ethanoic acid. So we need all of these values in molar concentrations so that we can actually, by deduction, work out that aspirin concentration. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing that we would need to do is produce a stock solution of salicylic acid. So that's where we dissolve a known amount of salicylic acid. Remember, that's what we're measuring, not the aspirin. So you've got that known amount. So you know the concentration in this flask. And then once you've produced that, you would then do a series of dilutions. So you've got several then stock solutions of salicylic acid at different concentrations. Then you take those different stock solutions and you would put them in a UV cuvette at the same wavelength that we, we did our other monitoring experiment on and we'd see what the absorbance was. So from the first, you can sort of see we plotted that on the graph of absorbance against concentration. And then from the next dilution, so obviously that's slightly more dilute, so you can see the absorbance has fallen. And then subsequently for all of the other stock solutions that we've got, we would plot those on the graph. And you can actually see that there is a straight line relationship that we've got here between concentration and absorbance. So you could just do this with graph paper it would be good practice, in fact, to do that. Um, and then you could just read across from the absorbance, and that would give you the concentration. So if you were looking at your, your samples from the, the previous experiment, when we're looking at the breakdown of aspirin to salicylic acid, if you have an absorbance reading, which is only in arbitrary units, you can literally just read across from the arbitrary units on the y-axis over to the line, then down, and that will then tell you what the concentration is of salicylic acid inside that, um, that sample that you've got. So what we would tend to do rather than using graph paper is use something like um, software like Excel or Google Sheets, where you would plot this for you and uh, you would then get the software to actually work out the equation of that straight line. And it's actually something called the Beer-Lambert law, um, which uh, relates the absorbance, A, to the concentration, C. And the other two values that you've got on there, so um, you, you've got um, L that we've got, which is just the, 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 the length of the pathway that the light is shining through in the cuvette. So we don't really need to consider that because the pathway is the same um, whether we're looking at our sample or whether we're looking at our calibration curve. So we can sort of simply get, get rid of that. So in effect, what the Beer-Lambert law is uh, telling you is that the relationship is equal to epsilon times concentration. So if you were to work out the gradient of that straight line, so to work out the gradient, we just look at the difference. We, well, we just take two points on that straight line. Ideally, we take them uh, quite, a, quite far apart. So you look at the difference in the y coordinates, and then you divide that by the difference of the 
x coordinates and if you were to do that that would give you the gradient and that would give you the value of epsilon and from that you can then work out uh, what the concentration of salicylic acid is in any unknown um, standard or uh, sorry any unknown sample that we've uh, produced when we're looking at the degradation of aspirin. So in the next of these tutorials, that's tutorial three, predicting expiry dates, we will then think a little bit more about how we can actually assign a specific date to a medicine when we're looking at a uh, breakdown of, uh, of this nature.